pulled it off. I've watched Sex and City every episode growing up. So, actually, I guess I was an adult when that was in front of me. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. We are uh, Dylan. Are we live? We're live. We're live streaming this tonight. Man, it feels really dark. Do you care to turn those lights on for me? Thank you. So, uh, I have been asked about since I've been at this church more than uh, probably uh, more than anything to preach on the book of Revelation. And I have been a bit hesitant. Uh, and the main reason is not that I'm necessarily scared to to preach through it, even though maybe a little bit. Um, but the main reason is I, I hold some quite different views than what is popular in the Western world today. And so, I, but I feel like that I owe it to you as the shepherd of this church, or the under-shepherd of this church. I want to be careful there. Christ is the shepherd of this church. But as, as an elder of this church, and my job is to teach you and to prepare you, and one of the things that I think I need to teach you, particularly in the state that our country is in right now, I, I need to teach you how to prepare for suffering, for persecution, and that's in large part what the book of Revelation is about. And, and to, I feel like it's my job to remind you and to encourage you that Christ is still on the throne, right? God is still on the throne, and He is working out His purposes in the world. And one day, uh, as we get to the end of Revelation, we are reminded that His kingdom will come in fullness. Christ will return to consummate His kingdom on the earth. All right? So, let me begin by saying this. If you, if you don't learn anything else, learn this. It is revelation, not revelations, right? You laugh because you know we've all probably said that, right? Uh, hey, you ever going to preach on revelations? Well, maybe the revelation. But uh, anyway, so yeah, learn that. Revelation, not revelations. So let me t tonight begin by just giving you an overview of kind of where we're headed what this series is going to look like. Well, normally when I preach through a book of the Bible like I am on Sunday mornings right now, I pretty much go verse by verse or at least small section by s small section, right? Like we're in part 22 Sunday and we're not even out of chapter 7, all right? Well, if I do that in Revelation, uh, Jesus will come back before I'm finished, <laughs> Or we will die before I'm finished. One or the other is going to happen because it would take forever. But what I'm going to do, and I think this is more helpful, uh, more helpful approach when it comes to Revelation. I'm going to journey through this book in greater chunks. So instead of going verse by verse, it's kind of chunk by chunk, if you will. All right? And I think that'll be helpful. I, we'll still get the main message, but I'm not going to give every single detail of every single verse. All right? Secondly, I want to say, this is going to be a little bit different than our normal Wednesday night services. Normally, I like to have discussion and go back and forth. I'm not going to do that during this series for two reasons. Number one, we're live streaming. They can't hear what you say. It brings, you know, confusion to them. We'll, we, and, and we're recording this. We want to put it on our podcast, and there's going to be these big gaps of nothing, and so I don't think that's going to be very helpful. But secondly, I think that there are probably in this room multiple different views on the book of Revelation, and I'm going to present those views to you, and you can decide where you fall uh, in, in that matter. But I th think that if I open it up and we're back and forth on basic interpretation, it's only going to cause confusion, and Revelation is difficult enough as it is, Right. So uh, what you can do, I, I think, Dylan, if you'll put that slide up on the screen. Keep going. Okay, apparently I don't have that slide. You can leave it there. But my email address, oh, it's on your handout. Did everybody get a handout when they came in? They're on the back table if you'd like one. I really encourage you, even if you're not a note taker, Please write some of this down because it's, it's a lot of information, all right? So one other thing I want to say as I talk about where we're headed, there are, as, as I mentioned, hang on one second, make sure everybody has a, a note. 
Welcome to our online audience, too. Thank you for watching. I'm sure there's millions of you around the world. So, as I mentioned, there are a few, uh, really four main views to interpreting the book of, of Revelation. I'm going to actually deal with those next week. And what I would like to say is that most of those views fit within the framework of what we might call Christian orthodoxy. In other words, they've been accepted by the church in, in different parts. So, I, I say that at the start of this to say, listen, if you disagree with my take, we can still be friends, all right? Nod your head if you agree, because I, I'm tell, my view is probably different than most of what you guys have heard and been taught, okay? But I think my view is historical, so let me just say that. And, and I think my view is, is a correct interpretation. And my, just to let you know, I've, I've only held to this view the last two years, so it's changed. I, I held for many, many years to the, the classic, or I shouldn't even say classic, the Western reading of the book of Revelation. So let's approach this with great humility and, and learn from one another and be okay with disagreeing, okay? Let's pray and we'll jump into this. Father, we love you and we're grateful for your word. This is a, a difficult book and I pray that you would give me gr the grace and the, the wisdom to preach it. May I preach it with clarity, with passion, with fervency and may you give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say through your word. Father, we love you so much, and uh, be with us tonight. We welcome you in this place. Amen. So I want you to start out in your hand out there. You see it on the screen. I want you to fill in the blank, all right? With your answer, one word, revelation is blank. Dun, 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 dun. Revelation is blank. If you had to describe it in one word, what would you say? Well, let me give you a, a, a few common answers that I think probably some of you put. How many of you said that Revelation is difficult, confusing, puzzling, something along those lines? So, Okay, my wife is the only one that finds it difficult. All right. It is difficult. It actually is. But not for the reasons that we may think. I, I would say this. I, I would argue that the first century church actually didn't find it difficult at all because it was in their uh, genre that they were familiar with. It was in their language. They understood the context of what they themselves were dealing with. And so I don't think it would have been quite an issue for them. But let me tell you one of the reasons why it's difficult for us. Number one is, is because it relies heavily on the Old Testament. And how many know that sometimes as contemporary Christians, we almost always read the New Testament. We memorize the New Testament. But we know sometimes very little about the Old Testament. So you, there are tons of references that, that pull from Genesis, Exodus, Isaiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, um, Daniel, and really almost every single book of the Old Testament is referenced. I mean, they don't say Genesis, but it's, it's a reference to the Old Testament scriptures. So it's difficult for us because sometimes we don't have a good grasp on the Old Testament. And if you don't, don't stop coming and say, oh, I just can't get it. No, that's what I'm here for, to help you by, by showing you those, those references. Number two, it's difficult because it employs the use of symbols. We're going to talk about this in great deal next week, but let me just give you a little overview here. Numbers are used, which are symbolic. Now, as Westerners, we like to say, oh, seven years is seven years. Three is three. A thousand is a thousand, so on and so forth. But actually, three, seven, ten, twelve, six, 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 a thousand, 144,000, these are symbolic numbers referencing a greater truth. Then you have the use of colors to drive home some truth, all right? Like white, red, scarlet, purple, black. These colors mean something. Then you have persons like the elders, the prostitute of Babylon, right, that are 
symbolic of a greater truth. Then you have animals such as the beast, the dragon, the horse, the lamb, the lion. These are symbols that point to something that is true, a truth of God. Then you have objects, right? In the first chapter, what do you have? Lampstands. What's, that sounds like a story I would make up, right? Like, uh, yeah, you have lampstands, and then you have stars like that represent something else. Then you have places such as Babylon, Egypt, Jerusalem, Sodom that are all symbolic. Now, it's interesting that sometimes John tells us exactly what these symbols mean, like the seven lampstands. What do they stand for? Anybody know? Seven churches. Yep. And then you have the seven, what is it, stars that represent what? It's the angels or the messengers of the churches. So there's times that John tells us what the symbols mean because the angel has told uh, him and Christ told the angel, right? And revealed it to the angel. So there are times that we know exactly what the symbols mean. They're not ambiguous. But then there are many times where John doesn't explain. And I think part of the reason is, is that the first century audience, the original recipients of this letter, would have known but nine times out of ten, those references, we can find out what they mean by simply going back to the Old Testament, to Daniel, to Ezekiel, to Genesis, Exodus, so on and so forth, Isaiah. So, Revelation, because of all these uh, things and more, it, it's difficult. But it's worth pushing through the difficulty, amen? Secondly, maybe some of you wrote this, uh, Revelation is ignored, it is often ignored. It's funny, I heard uh, Pastor Vody Bachman said that he found a study that said the most requested book of the Bible that, that lay people request to be preached is the book of Revelation. And then there was another survey that asked pastors, what is the, the book you don't like to preach the most? And uh, I don't know if that sentence may, uh, was clear, but... Yeah, and, and they said, Revelation, like, we don't want to preach on Revelation. So, like, the church people want to hear it, the pastors don't want to preach it. But it is often ignored, though, even through the church. Like, I don't know how often you sit at home and read the book of Revelation, but it's, it's not overly common. But why is it ignored? Well, one, as we've said, it's difficult. So, sometimes when things are difficult, you just kind of say, well, I'm just going to ignore it. But there's another reason, all right? Don't be mad at me. Everybody look at me. Don't be mad at me, all right? But in our contemporary world, there's this belief uh, that the church will be raptured before any kind of tribulation, right? It's a common, that's the predominant belief this side of the world, contemporary culture. So if that is the case, and I'm going to argue next week that that is... Uh, not the case, and I'm pretty confident in that, and I hope I'm wrong but I don't think I am. So you got to come back next week and I'll give you biblical and historical arguments as to why I don't think that is truth, um, why the rapture um, is, is not in the Bible. So if it is, though, here's what that means. Revelation chapters 4 through 19 do not apply to the church. Why read them? Why read chapters 4 through 19? It's all about suffering and persecution that will happen. And if it's all future and we're going to be taken out, who cares? And that's the approach. So matter of fact, when you hear Revelation preached in most churches, if you go to church um, in, in America and you hear the book of Revelation preached, you're going to probably hear something from chapters 1, 2, or 3, or perhaps 20, 21, 22. That's it. Right? So you come back next week, and I'll tell you why I don't think the, uh, at least a pre-tribulation rapture uh, is, is the case, is what the Bible teaches. All right, by the way, our denomination believes that. And uh, I, there are a lot of great theologians that do believe it, and so we can agree not to agree, right? So Revelation is often ignored, but there's another extreme. This is the other end of the spectrum. You could fill in the blank like this. Revelation is abused. Dr. Shane Wood points this out. When someone is hyper-focused on the book of Revelation, every detail, every verse, right? Here's what happens. Life becomes about Revelation. Do you know anybody like that right now in the mix of vaccines and masks and disease and all of this, right? So, like, if you're hyper-focused on Revelation, then 
Matthew, the book of Matthew is about revelation when you read it. If you're reading the epistles, uh, Paul's writings, Peter's writings, they're about revelation. If you're reading a newspaper, come on, it's about revelation, right? If you're watching CNN or Fox News, it's about revelation. And I think this is dangerous, all right? So both ignoring the book and abusing the book are unhealthy. So we need to find this balance. We need to read it. We need to take it very seriously, but we need to refuse to abuse it. All right, so we've talked about filling in this blank that revelation is difficult. It's often ignored. It's often abused. I'm interested to hear. I know I said I wasn't going to do discussion, but shout out your one-word answer. Divine, good, yeah. What? Prophecy, good. Anybody else want to share? Yeah, great answers. Let me close this section out by saying this. Uh, I think it would be an accurate fill-in here. Revelation is a blessing. Revelation is a blessing. And say, well, why do you say that? Well, I didn't, that thought did not originate with me. Look at verse 3, if you would. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one. Now, does that statement sound familiar? Where do you see that at? You better know. <laughs> Matthew, yeah, we're preaching through this right now. So the Beatitudes, right? This is a Beatitude. The word blessed, just, it means happy, but it's more than just kind of this chipper surface happiness. It's content. It's to have the favor of the Lord on your life. So blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, talking about the book of Revelation. And blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So you're blessed not just if you read it. There's a lot of people who read it. You're blessed if you read it, you hear what it says, and you what? You do it. All right? So there are actually seven Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. So I want to drive this home. This book is meant to be a blessing to you, O Christian. All right? Let's just look at these real quickly. Revelation 14, 13. Don't I think there is a, um, is there a chart on that next slide? No. Okay. Is, is there a chart in your handout? Did I write these out for you? If not, you can just kind of jot these down. So, Revelation 14, 13. By the way, seven Beatitudes. Do you remember me saying seven is symbolic? It's a, it's a number that signifies completion. So, you are completely blessed by this book. Amen? Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Listen, people are being persecuted. And he says, hey, when you die, if you die before the return of the Lord, you are blessed if you're in Christ. Revelation 16, 15 is the next one. Behold, I am coming like a thief, says the Lord. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on. Now you say, okay, so I should never be naked, right? In case the Lord, you know, you got to shower in your clothes, right? And all this stuff. It's like if the Lord comes back when I'm in the shower, like I'm... No, this is not about being nude. To be clothed, it has to do with righteousness. To be naked is to be living like the world, to be exposed, okay? So he says, blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he, he may not go about naked and be seen exposed, all right? Then there's Revelation 19, 19. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Oh, what a great day that will be. Amen. Revelation 20, verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priest of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Revelation, uh, excuse me. I think I skipped one, but Revelation twenty two fourteen. I'll give you one more. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Again, it has to do with righteousness. So the book is meant to be a blessing. Do you agree with that? We can all agree on that, right? So let's now move on to what we call historical context. 
So before we jump in and start talking about verses and sections, before you read any book of the Bible, like if you're going to interpret it, you start with one question. What did it mean to the original biblical audience? But that's not the way most lay people do it today, and unfortunately, it's not the way most pastors approach a text today. I'll tell you the first question that's asked normally in the Western world when a text is approached or a book of the Bible is being preached from. What does this mean to me? Now, we can get there. We need to know what it means to us, but that is not the starting point because you can make the Bible say and mean about anything you want if you start there, right? So the first question is, what what does it mean in its historical context? So let's start by just talking about the author. Who is the author? He, He names himself. It's John. He names himself three times in chapter 1, verses 1, verse 4, verse 9, and then again in chapter 22, verse 8. So he simply refers to himself as John, right? Could you imagine if you just found a letter? I mean, think of all the people you know that that are named John, and you just get a letter that says, hey, this is from John. It'd be kind of confusing, right? Which John is it? So there's a little bit of debate about which John this is, but in general, and kind of the historical consensus is that this is John the Apostle, all right? Now, John says he wrote this from the island of Patmos. He was persecuted, he was in exile, and this is where he receives these truths from the Lord. So why do scholars believe, in fact, that this is John the Apostle? I'm glad you asked. Number one is this, an author who did not mention his authority would be someone of some type of, some level of prestige, making it unnecessary to include his office. So he assumes people are going to know this is John the Apostle, right? It's also a sign, side note, a a sign of his humility. I love this, and Paul does this a, a couple of times in his letters. He doesn't say, start his letters by saying, oh, I, John, the apostle. What's he say? I, John, am a servant of the Lord. And oh, how we need that type of humility. I shouldn't go around boasting, oh, I'm the pastor of real life community. No, I am a servant of the Lord. You, if you are in Christ, are a servant of the Lord first and foremost. But then we go to the early church fathers who were closely connected to the apostles And they believe that this was written by John the Apostle. You have uh, Justin the Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria. And they all believe that this was written by the Apostle John. So this is the general uh, consensus. Now let me give you one argument against this being the Apostle John. So some scholars say, well, there's too much difference in style between Revelation and and the other books of the Bible that John wrote. So you got to have the Gospel of John. You have 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the epistles or letters, right? So they say, well, the styling's too different. Like the Gospel and the epistles are kind of coherent, but man, Revelation is just a totally different style. Well, is that a really good argument? I don't think so because the Gospel and the epistles are a different genre of writing. And Revelation is totally different. It's apocalyptic literature, right? It's totally different. Let me give you an example. Let's say that someone, let, let's say that someone that doesn't necessarily know me somehow got a hold of every college paper that I wrote about the Bible. Because they went to Bible college and they say they find this binder full of academic papers that I've written. And they know it's me. My name's on there, my birth date, whatever. They know it's me, right? And then they come across a sermon manuscript that's not doesn't have my name on it, but Jan says, Oh, this is this is Chris's sermon. And they might say, you know what, I don't think it is, because we have a whole binder full of papers that he's written, and the style is just too different. Well, I think that's easily explained because I preach quite differently. Or I, I would write a sermon manuscript quite differently. I would use a different style than if I were writing a college paper because you would be bored out of your mind if I I did not change the tone uh, or style of my sermons, right? So it's extremely likely that Revelation was written by John the Apostle. 
Next, what about the date and occasion? Occasion. So I believe it was written in the 90s. Now, not the 1990s, all right? If you're new to church, you're like, oh, man, this is pretty new. Actually, some of you think that's old, right? So, no, it's, it's written in the first century, so 90 to 96 A.D., somewhere in there, right? So some scholars believe that Revelation, Revelation was written in the 60s. Okay, again, not the 1960s, but the first century, so 60 A.D., sometime in there. While Nero was the emperor. Right? So that, that's their argument. But most scholars that I read and really have respect for really all agree that it was written when Domitian was emperor. He was emperor from 81 to 96 A.D. And so there's, there's three reasons why we believe this. Number one, again, the early church father, uh, especially Arrhenius, is interpreted as, as saying that the book was written during this time of Domitian. Then, it's extremely likely that the pressure to worship the emperor, like this imperial cult, this Remember, it, I mean, if you know anything about Roman history, like, this was a real deal. Like, the emperor didn't want you just to obey him. He wanted worship. And this was increased under Domitian's rule. So, when you consider the persecution that you'll see throughout the book of Revelation, it's, I, I think that Revelation fits into this reality. All right? So, I, I think it's really clear. And then one more point here, why I think it was written in the mid-90s, Dr. Schreiner, a great professor in Louisville, points out that the city Laodicea, right, You've, it's one of the churches that, that John is writing to, it's described in Revelation chapter 3 as a rich city, a rich city. But what's interesting is we know that there was a great earthquake in 60 or 61, sometime in there, all right? And a date in the 60s would not, it would have been way too early for the city to have recovered its riches. Like it was des, desolated, right? So, for those reasons and probably more, I believe sometime in the 90s it was written. So, what is the occasion? This is really important. It's likely that Revelation was written to a group of believers, a community of believers, the seven churches, right, of Asia Minor, who were experiencing great persecution. Number one, physical persecution. Like their lives were at stake. Their livelihood was at stake. But secondly, they were experiencing religious persecution. They didn't worship the, the Roman and, and the you know, Greek gods. And, and even the Jews who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, they hated Christians. And it's likely that they turned them over to the authorities anytime they could. So they face physical persecution, they face religious discrimination, but thirdly, you know what they faced? Revelation deals with this. They face social pressure to conform to the secular world. You know, when you've got every, I mean, if you, again, know any history about Rome, like, it was pretty loose morally, right? Some, yeah, that's probably a vast understatement. And this is how people are living around them, and they're pressured to not live by biblical standards, but to just live like everybody else. Um, one, the temptation to sin is just great. But two, we like to be liked. We like to fit in. We don't want to be a peculiar people like the Lord has called us to be. So let's just think about this. Why is Re Revelation relevant to us today? Well, think about what we go through. Think about physical persecution like most of us aren't dealing with that type right now. But let's think about those poor believers in Afghanistan right? They're facing physical persecution. It's funny when Westerners say, oh, before the Lord returns, it's going to get so much worse. Tell that to those believers who are hiding in their homes, being tortured, being murdered for the sake of the gospel. It might get worse here, but it's been bad since the first century, right? Then let's consider the discrimination, even here, that Christians experience. We talked about religious discrimination, like we used to be respected in our country. Now we are hated. We're, we're labeled bigots and extremists and elitist and fanatical people, right? So we experience this. And finally, let's consider the social pressure that we're under. 
like in our own country, to conform to the secular world, to the LGBTQ agenda, to pro-choice, to, to live by the loose morals of the world, to say, oh, anything goes, to live like everybody else. That is a real pressure for us. And the book of Revelation calls us away from that into true holiness. So Revelation then is relevant to all of us. Here's what it does. It encourages us under any level of persecution to endure to the end, right? And it reminds us that Christ is and will finally be victorious. His kingdom will be consummated, right? It's incredibly relevant. Next, let's talk about genre. Genre is important. So before we can interpret any book of the Bible, we must consider the genre. Let me just give you some examples. You, you should not read the Psalms as narratives. You're going to come across some problems, right? You, you should not read a narrative as poetry. There, there are different literary rules for different genres. Let me just give you a real common example. I hear people quote from Proverbs all the time and say, God promised. Proverbs are not promises. It is a book of wisdom. It's little nuggets to say, this is how the world normally works. But you remember the book of Job, also a book of wisdom? In Job, um, his friends treated spiritual tr or kind of proverbs or what they thought were proverbs. They treated them like absolute truth and promises, like black and white. So, Joe, you're suffering, so that must mean you sinned. Right? And so God takes Job in the end on this cosmic journey and shows him, no, you know what? You don't understand what it is to govern the world. You don't know why I do what I do. You can't fit me into a box. Now, there are clear promises in Scripture, but that's not what the Proverbs are. We've got to consider genre. Let me just give you an illustration of this. Dylan, go to that next slide for me, buddy. Did Dylan get raptured? <laughs> Dill, are you up there? All right, there we go. So let's just consider this newspaper headline, okay? So you're reading the paper. I don't know if anybody does that anymore. Tigers massacre Indians. I heard a professor give this to his students. This is a great example. Tigers massacre Indians. So if you were just to read this headline, the way that you would interpret it depends on what part of the paper you're in, what section, right? So let's just say you're in the sports section. What would you say? Well, the Detroit Tigers blew out the Cleveland Indians. Next year it'll be Guardians, so I can't use this, right? Not funny. All right. Um, then, though, if you were in the international section, then you would assume that the article is talking about actual tigers, like the animal, killing people in India. If you were in the local section, you would think that... Uh, Native Americans had an unfortunate, unfortunate experience at the zoo, right? The way you interpret it, I'm going to blow your mind here. Revelation was not written to us. It was written for us, but it was not written to us. It was written to a particular people at a particular time to deal with a particular situation. So it's an epistle. Number two, uh, I, I think somebody said prophecy. Is that you? You said prophecy. It is a book that's prophetic. Revelation 1.3, blesses the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Very clear. Now, here's the problem, though, with this. We've got to be careful because what do you think of when you think of prophecy? One word. Future. Anybody else? Often prediction, right? But... There's a great scholar, and, and, and he's, I think he's got two degrees tied to the book of Revelation. Like, he's incredibly intelligent. But he says this, only 17% of prophecies, prophecies in the Bible are related to the future. Now, I didn't take time to go through every biblical prophecy, to, but this is someone who I trust. So, to be sure, prophecy does include future events. But just think, only, what, 15 to 20% in the Bible is about future events. Well, 
Prophecy, what does it do then? It often addresses three questions. I'm reading through the Old Testament right now, and this is obvious. Here's what prophecy does. It answers the question, who is God? It always tells us something about God. Number two, what does God desire? And number three, what does God demand of his people? So here's where prophecy normally emerges. When does it emerge? When you go to the Old Testament. When the people of God are not doing what they're supposed to do, right? That's normally when prophecy emerges. And so he'll he'll call up um, a a prophet and he'll use that prophet for to be his mouthpiece. And he'll say to the people, you're wicked. You're following idols. You're supposed to be my people. And if you don't stop it, I'm going to crush you. I'm going to send you into exile. Uh, you, You know, you're going to be ill. Whatever it is, you're messing up. But then he always gives, or normally gives, this call to repentance. If you'll repent, if you'll do this, then I will forgive you. So prophecy reveals who God is, what he desires, and what he demands of his people. And we see this in the book of Revelation. I mean, when you read the letters to the specific churches, he deals with their issues and he tells them what to do about them. All right? So the book of Revelation, don't miss this, it's calling each of us to evaluate our own walk with the Lord, to turn from the ways of the world. Like if you're a name-only Christian, if people out there can't tell that you're different from the world, Revelation would call you to repent and to truly come to Christ. It's prophetic, but finally, this is what Revelation means, it is apocalyptic. Now, what do you think of when you think of apocalypse? The end, right? The end. Well, I don't know that that's how the first century would have taken that. This is a type of literature that we're not real familiar with. But the first century Jews would have been extremely. This was a a common way of writing in the first century. So let me just simplify what apocalyptic literature is. It is a revelation of transcendent realities. In other words, realities beyond what we can see. Often communicated by other worldly beings like angels here, right? An angel. So in Revelation, the message is communicated to John through the angel who acts as Jesus' messenger. So it's it's a way of seeing another reality. Like we know that there's, like we don't see everything that God sees, right? There's something going on behind the scenes. That's what it is. I I like to say it like this. Apocalyptic literature is removing the veil. That's the point. To remove the veil so that you can clearly see. How many of you have seen the movie uh, Dead Poet Society? You ever seen that? It's got Robin Williams in it. Remember, he's a teacher. He's an English teacher. And there's a particular scene where he has each of his students, one by one, stand on the top of his desk. You remember that scene? And they're kind of freaked out. What's going on? And he says, when you get up here, and he first stands on the desk, he says, you see things from a different perspective. And so what apocalyptic literature does, it invites us to stand on the desk, if you will, and to see things from a different perspective and, better yet, God's perspective. Because we get bogged down with all the garbage that's going on in our world, and we think, oh, woe is me, what's going on, what's, what's God, you know, what's he thinking? And Revelation reminds us God is on the throne. There are things going on that we don't see that are preparing for the final kingdom to come, the consummation of that kingdom, right? So that's what it is. Um, We need to keep this in mind if we're going to correctly interpret Revelation. And by the way, um, one of the questions I get when we approach Revelation is, well, is it literal or symbolic? I don't like that question. Like, what do you mean? Apocalyptic liter- literature is symbols. So symbols are symbols, and I take that literally, right? Like it's confusing. Like, no, I don't think Babylon is really a w- prostitute. Like I think it's a symbol, and it's pointing to a greater truth, right? So just because we don't take every word literally doesn't mean that we're mishandling Scripture, all right? 
What is the message of Revelation? I'm going to move quickly through this. Number one, there's a message about being willing, a willingness to suffer persecution for the sake of Jesus Christ. You know one of the reasons we believe in the rapture, we want to believe in it, is because we don't want to suffer like many other people around the world. We, in America, we like comfort, right? Like, we, we like air condition, right? In the summer, heat in the winter. We like fast food restaurants where you just drive by, right? And, and you, you, we like convenience. We like comfort. We don't want to think because we haven't experienced true persecution in this company, our country, when it comes to particularly our faith, right? We, we don't know that. And we've lived in such peace for so long that we can't bear the thought of going through some kind of tribulation. So it's easy and it's comforting to think, oh, man, we're just going to be gone, right? So again, come back next week and I'll tell you why I don't believe that's the case. You might not want to come back next week. Um, number two, what's another message? And there are actually many. Um, it, it shows God's sovereignty throughout history. Revelation shows the culmination of everything that's been prophesied in the Old Testament. You know, though the Lord has tarried in some things, it will finally come to an end and every prophecy will be fulfilled. So it shows God's sovereignty that he is at work. He's been at work throughout all of history. He was at work when uh, Israel was exiled, when Judah was exiled. He was at work. He was on the throne, though people doubted it, when Jesus was crucified. It's all part of his redemptive plan. How comforting is it to know that he is, again, still on the throne, that he's doing his work and his will. Finally, um, the message of Revelation is the culmination of all things, the consummation of the kingdom of God. And we talk a great deal about this in this church. The, the goal of Christianity is not to go to heaven. The, the final hope we have is about heaven coming to earth, to have glorified bodies, to live in the new and better Eden, to always forever be with the Lord. That kingdom is coming where every wrong will be made right. Every injustice will be made right. There will be finally and forever true justice on the earth. Every tear shall be wiped from our eyes. There'll be no more pain, no more suffering. That's the hope. And it's not us floating up on a cloud somewhere. It's here in the renewed earth. So let me close with this. Some final thoughts here. How do we approach Revelation? Number one, redundant from my opening, but I want to say it again, approach it with humility. So if you disagree with me on some of these things, like if you believe in the rapture after next week, hey, fine, I actually hope you're right. Right? Like I like to be right, but on this, like, Okay, I'll high-five you if you're right on, on Rapture Day, right? Rapture Day. I, that, I might make a T-shirt that says that. So we've got to approach it with humility. There, there are scholars, I mean trustworthy scholars, who land on many, in many different places. But here's the thing. The message doesn't change. The message that I just gave you doesn't change. No matter if, as long as you're within those orthodox interpretations, Right? Those four main interpretations. So the message is still there. So we can agree to disagree. Number two, approach Revelation prayerfully. If a man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally, right? So pray. Number three, this is important. Don't miss the forest for the trees. Some of you are so focused on the stinking mark of the beast, which is way taken out of context that you miss the whole beauty of the book of Revelation. You're on these minute details. All you think about is 666, a microchip, a vaccine. Stop it. Okay? The book of Revelation, excuse me, the book of Revelation is, um, it's not a puzzle book. It is a picture book. It's images. It's not a puzzle book, all right? Number four, as you read it, 
Those who do not bear the fruit of salvation. I'm not asking you, did you pray a prayer at the altar? I'm not even asking you, did you get baptized? I'm saying, does your life bear the fruit of salvation? If it does not, you should read this with great trepidation or horror, if you like. This ought to scare, what is it, the bejeebies? Is that a word? Yeah, the, yeah, whatever, out of you. You fill in the blank there, too. I mean, seriously. Because either... Death or persecution can, is always imminent, or, or the return of Christ, rather. It's imminent. So, <laughs> I mean, if you're not living right, if you're, I don't care if you read your Bible, I don't care if you pray, if your life does not bear the fruit of salvation, read this with great trepidation, and may it lead you to repentance. And finally, for those who are real followers of Jesus, read it with great joy. Because it is a book of hope and a book that is about victory for us because Christ is victorious and we who are in Christ shall be and are victorious. Amen? So there you have it. So I want to invite you back uh, next week. I, I wanted to watch a video. You know what? Do you guys have time to watch just Dylan, how long is that first video? Or Bob, whoever you are. <laughs> okay. Do you have time to watch just a short video? This is, this is really cool. So as he's getting that, just remember, if you have questions, fine. Email those to me, and my goal is to next week start by answering questions. But keep them specific to what I talked about tonight, because your questions will be answered probably if there are other questions throughout the series, okay? Maybe no video? The book of the Revelation of Jesus. All right, here we go. The author of this book, which is not called Revelations, by the way, is named at the beginning. It was written by John, which could refer to the beloved disciple who wrote the gospel and the letters of John, or it could be a different John, a messianic Jewish prophet who traveled about and taught in the early church. Whichever John it was, he makes clear in the opening paragraph what kind of book he has written. He calls it, first of all, a revelation or apocalypse. The Greek word is apokalupsis, and it refers to a type of literature very familiar to John's readers from the Hebrew scriptures and from other popular Jewish texts. Apocalypse has recounted a prophet's symbolic dreams and visions that revealed God's heavenly perspective on history and current events so that the present could be viewed in light of history's final outcome. And John says this apocalypse is a prophecy, which means it's a word from God spoken through a prophet to God's people, usually to warn or comfort them in a time of crisis. By calling this book a prophecy, John's saying that it stands in the tradition of the biblical prophets and is bringing their message to a climax. And this apocalyptic prophecy was sent to real people that John knew. The book opens and closes as a circular letter that was sent to seven churches in the ancient Roman province of Asia. Now, seven is a meaningful number for John. It's a symbol of completeness based on the seven-day Sabbath cycle in the Old Testament. And John has woven sevens into every single part of this book. Now, with this opening, John has given us clear guidance about how he wants us to understand this book. Jewish apocalypse is communicated through symbolic imagery and numbers. It is not a secret predictive code about the timing of the end of the world. Rather, John is constantly using these symbols that are drawn from the Old Testament, and he expects his readers to go discover what the symbols mean by looking up the text he's alluding to. Also, the fact that it's a letter means that John is actually addressing the situation of these first century churches. And so while this book has much to say to Christians of later generations, the book's meaning must first be anchored in the historical context of John's time, place, and audience. Which brings us into the book's first section, Jesus' message to the seven churches. John was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he saw a vision of the risen Jesus exalted as king of the world. And he was standing among seven burning lights. And John's told this is a symbol of the seven churches in Asia Minor that's been adapted from the book of the prophet Zechariah. And Jesus starts addressing the specific problems that face each church. Some were apathetic due to wealth and affluence. Others were morally compromised. Their people were still eating ritual meals and sleeping around in pagan temples. But others among the churches remained faithful to Jesus, and they were suffering harassment and even violent persecution. And Jesus warns that things are going to get worse. A tribulation is upon the churches that will force them to choose between compromise or faithfulness. 
By John's day, the murder of Christians by the Roman Emperor Nero was passed, and the persecution of Christians by Emperor Domitian was likely underway. And so the temptation was to deny Jesus, either to avoid persecution or simply to join the spirit of the Roman age. And Jesus calls them to faithfulness so that they can overcome or literally conquer. And Jesus promises a reward for everyone in these churches who does conquer. Each reward is drawn directly from the book's final vision about the marriage of heaven and earth. And so this opening section, it sets up the main plot tension that will drive the storyline in this book. Will Jesus' people endure? Will they inherit the new world that God has in store? And why is faithfulness to Jesus described as conquering? The rest of the book is John's answer. After this, John has a vision of God's heavenly throne room, and he describes it with imagery drawn from many Old Testament prophets. Surrounding God are creatures and elders that represent all creation and human nations, and they're giving honor and allegiance to the one true creator God who is holy, holy, holy. In God's hand is a scroll that's closed up with seven wax seals. It symbolizes the message of the Old Testament prophets and the sealed scroll of Daniel's visions. These are all about how God's kingdom will come here fully on earth as in heaven. But it turns out, no one is able to open the scroll until John hears of someone who can. It's the lion from the tribe of Judah and the root of David. He can open it. These are classic Old Testament descriptions of the messianic king who would bring God's kingdom through military conquest. Now, that's what John hears. But then what he turns and sees is not an aggressive lion king, but a sacrificed bloody lamb who's alive, standing there, and ready to open the scroll. Now, this symbol of Jesus as the slain lamb, this is crucially important for understanding the book. John's saying that the Old Testament promise of God's future victorious kingdom was inaugurated through the crucified Messiah. Jesus overcame his enemies by dying for them as the true Passover lamb so that they could be redeemed. Because of the resurrection, Jesus' death on the cross was not a defeat. It was his enthronement. It was the way he conquered evil. And so this vision concludes with the lamb alongside the one sitting on the throne. And together they are worshipped as the one true creator and redeemer. And the slain lamb begins to open the scroll. It's a symbol of his divine authority to guide history to its conclusion. Which brings us to the next section of the book, the three cycles of seven. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And each cycle depicts God's kingdom and justice coming here on earth as in heaven. Now, some people think that the three sets of seven divine judgments represent a literal linear sequence of events that either happened in the past or could be happening now or are yet to happen in the future when Jesus returns. But notice how John has woven all the sevens together. So the final seven bowls come out of the seventh trumpet and the seventh seal. And the seven trumpets emerge from the seventh seal. They're like nesting dolls. Each seventh contains the next seven. Also notice how each of the series of seven culminates in the final judgment, and they have matching conclusions. So it's more likely that John is using each set of seven to depict the same period of time between Jesus' resurrection and future return from three different perspectives. So the slain lamb begins to open the scroll's first four seals. And John sees four horsemen. It's an image from the book of Zechariah chapter 1. And they symbolize times of war, conquest, famine, and death. In other words, a tragically average day in human history. Then the fifth seal depicts the murdered Christian martyrs before God's heavenly throne. And the cry of their innocent blood rises up before God like smoke from the altar of incense. And they're told to rest because more Christians are yet to die. We're not told why, but we are told that it won't last forever. The sixth seal is God's ultimate response to their cry. He brings the great day of the Lord that was described in Isaiah and Joel, and the people of the earth cry out, who is able to stand? And then all of a sudden, John pauses the action with an intermission to answer that question. John sees an angel with a signet ring coming to place a mark of protection on God's servants who are enduring all this hardship. And he hears the number of those who are sealed, 144,000. It's a military census, like the one in the book of Numbers, chapter 1. There are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, pay attention. The number of this army is what John heard, just like he heard about the conquering lion of Judah. But in both cases, what he then turned and saw was the surprising fulfillment of those military images in Jesus, the slain lamb. 
So when he sees this messianic army of God's kingdom, it's made up of people from all nations, fulfilling God's ancient promise to Abraham. It's this multi-ethnic army of the lamb who can stand before God because they've been redeemed by the lamb's blood. And now they are called to conquer, not by killing their enemies, but by suffering and bearing witness just like the lamb. After this, the seventh and final seal is broken. But before the scroll is opened, the seven warning trumpets emerge and fire is taken from the incense altar. It symbolizes the cry of the martyrs and it's cast onto the earth, bringing the day of the Lord to its completion. Now, with the seven trumpets, John backs up and he retells the story again, this time with images from the Exodus story. So the first five trumpet blasts replay the plague sent upon Egypt. And then the sixth trumpet releases the four horsemen that came from the first four seals. But then John tells us that despite all these plagues, the nations did not repent, just like Pharaoh didn't in the Exodus story. So it seems that God's judgment alone will not bring people to humble repentance before him. Then John pauses the action again with another intermission. An angel brings the unsealed scroll that was opened by the Lamb. And just like Ezekiel, John is told to eat the scroll and then proclaim its message to the nations. Finally, the Lamb's scroll is open, and now we will discover how God's kingdom will come here on earth. The scroll's content is spelled out in two symbolic visions. First, John sees God's temple and the martyrs by the altar, and he's told to measure and set them apart. It's an image of protection taken from Zechariah chapter 2. But then the outer courts in the city are excluded, and they get trampled down by the nations. Now, some think that this refers literally to a destruction of Jerusalem that happened in the past or will happen in the future. But more likely, John's following the tradition of Jesus and the apostles who all used the new temple as a symbol for God's new covenant people. In that case, this is an image about how Jesus' followers may suffer persecution by the nations, but this external defeat cannot take away their victory through the Lamb. This idea gets expanded in the scroll's second vision. God appoints two witnesses as prophetic representatives to the nations. And once again, some people think this refers literally to two prophets who will appear one day in the future. But John calls them lampstands, which is one of his clear symbols for the churches. So this vision is more likely about the prophetic role of Jesus' followers, who are to take up the mantle of Moses and Elijah and call idolatrous nations and rulers to turn back to the one true God. But then, all of a sudden, a horrible beast appears. Let the reader remember Daniel chapter 7. And the beast conquers the witnesses and kills them. But then, God brings them back to life and vindicates the witnesses before their persecutors. And the end result is that many among the nations finally do repent and give glory to the Creator God in the day of the Lord. Now, stop. Think about the story so far. God's warning judgments through the seals and through the trumpets did not generate repentance among the nations, just like the Exodus plagues only hardened Pharaoh's heart. But the lamb, he conquered his enemies by loving them, dying for them. And now the message of the lamb's scroll reveals the mission of his army, the church. God's kingdom will be revealed when the nations see the church imitating the loving sacrifice of the lamb, not killing their enemies, but dying for them. It is God's mercy shown through Jesus' followers that will bring the nations to repentance. And this surprising claim is the message of the open scroll that John has placed at the exact center of the entire book. After this, the last trumpet sounds and the nations are shaken as God's kingdom comes here on earth as it is in heaven. So now we know how the church will bear witness to the nations and inherit the new creation, but who was that terrible beast that waged war on God's people? And how will the whole story turn out? John will tell us in the second half of the book of the Revelation.